Hello, and welcome to the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast, where we explore the latest in life extension and anti-aging science with a dive into a month's worth of insights and new breakthroughs. This podcast is a combined effort of the Life Extension Advocacy Foundation, which operates Lifespan.io, and Future Grind, a podcast that explores the ethics and impact of emerging science and technology. I'm Ryan O'Shea, and I'll be your host. The first month of the new year has come and gone, and labs around the world continue to work to solve the problem of aging. Let's take a look back at what happened in January. Kicking things off with our research roundup, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has spread rapidly across the globe, and many researchers have pivoted their existing work to help understand and fight the disease. Many viral infections have a disproportionate effect on the elderly, but COVID is an especially intriguing case because it does not seem to affect children and infants the way other viruses do. This suggests that the processes of aging may play an outsized role when it comes to vulnerability to COVID. Dr. Maria Blasco's group in Madrid, Spain, have recently investigated whether telomere length may play a role in COVID symptom severity. In their study, blood samples were taken from a total of 89 patients. When patients were grouped by age, no differences were seen in symptom severity for younger patients, but patients over 60 saw worse symptoms alongside shorter telomeres. This indicates that telomere length may play a role in symptom severity for these patients, although it is important to note that a correlational study such as this one cannot determine cause and effect. According to the study's abstract, These findings demonstrate that molecular hallmarks of aging, such as presence of short telomeres, can influence the severity of COVID-19 pathologies. As short telomeres can be elongated by telomerase, and telomerase activation strategies have been shown by us to delay aging and age-related pathologies, as well as to have therapeutic effects in diseases associated with short telomeres, such as pulmonary fibrosis, it is tempting to speculate that such telomerase activation therapies could ameliorate some of the tissue pathologies remaining in COVID-19 patients, such as fibrosis-like pathologies in the lungs after overcoming the viral infection. Glucosamine is commonly taken as a supplement to help with the joint pain and inflammation associated with aging. Now, a team of researchers in India has shown that glucosamine supplementation appears to have beneficial effects similar to those of caloric restriction. Caloric restriction is perhaps the most robust, effective method known to increase lifespan. Its effects were first reported nearly 100 years ago and have been confirmed in many experiments in a wide variety of organisms since then. In this study, the researchers treated young rats and accelerated aging rats with regular doses of glucosamine. They then examined a number of aging biomarkers. There was a significant rise in reactive oxygen species, or ROS, in both the young and the accelerated aging rats. ROS are reactive molecules and free radicals derived from oxygen, and while they do have some beneficial uses, they are also very harmful to cells. The researchers suggest that glucosamine spurs a transient increase in ROS, which in turn triggers a protective mitohermetic response. Mitohermesis describes a process in which low levels of mitochondrial ROS act as signaling molecules to trigger a cascade of cellular events that protect the cells from harmful effects. Essentially, the small amount of stress caused by the ROS encourages the cell to raise its shields. They believe that this response produces an effect similar to the stress response observed in caloric restriction, and multiple biomarkers showed that this is the case. It should be noted that these results are in rats, but the idea that similar effects may occur in humans taking glucosamine is not beyond the realm of possibility. Caloric restriction increases lifespan in multiple species, so finding a way to emulate this effect without the need to engage in caloric restriction could have value. While glucosamine may be a caloric restriction mimetic, new research from the Netherlands indicates that rapamycin is not. Although rapamycin reliably extends lifespan in a range of organisms, New research shows that it does not achieve this via the same pathways as caloric restriction. A few years ago, a team at Mayo Clinic, led by Dr. James Kirkland, treated mice with the cancer drug desatinib 
and the popular dietary supplement quercetin, with the results suggesting that the combination was able to destroy senescent cells. This combination was part of the first generation of drugs known as senolytics, compounds that encourage senescent cells to self-destruct in a process known as apoptosis, thus reducing chronic inflammation and improving tissue regeneration. Now, a new preprinted study explores the long-term effects of exposure to desatinib and quercetin on gut microbiome composition, senescent cell populations, and inflammation. With 10 controls in 10 aged mice, the researchers examined the guts of the animals to determine how desatinib and quercetin affected senescent cells and intestinal walls. The team noted that there were significant differences between the microbial signatures of the mice given to satinib and quercetin and the control mice. The researchers also noted that there was a direct correlation between elevated senescence and inflammation biomarkers and particular microbial signatures. While this is only a small study, this data suggests that senolytics may have a beneficial effect on the gut microbiome and might potentially reduce intestinal permeability and inflammation by addressing cellular senescence and modulation of the microbiome. Exercise is one of the best anti-aging interventions we have to date. It has been proven to alleviate many processes associated with aging, and it keeps your weight, blood pressure, and glucose levels at bay while delaying frailty. Now, a new review paper delivers evidence that exercise may also be a natural senolytic. Of the 21 articles analyzed, 16 demonstrated the senolytic effects of exercise on various markers of senescent cells. The main takeaway from the human studies was that, in general, physically active people have fewer senescent cells than sedentary people. Despite the limited number of studies, the scientists consider the evidence for the senolytic effect of exercise to be convincing, and they call for more research on animals and humans, and on various organs and tissues. That's it for our research roundup. For more information on these and other topics, you can visit lifespan.io forward slash roundup. Our Life Extend show has returned and now has its own YouTube channel. If you want to understand the science behind rejuvenation biotechnology, subscribe and enjoy an in-depth and easy-to-watch video every other Thursday. One of January's videos was the first in a series that will explore the different kinds of epigenetic features and their role in aging. Here's a clip from that video. One of the epigenetic features is how DNA is packaged into a structure known as chromatin. An easy way to understand it is to think about books. Depending on which book you have in mind, the text would stretch for somewhere between several hundred meters and a couple of kilometers if it were printed in a single straight line. That would be pretty inconvenient and impractical, so we invented things like books and scrolls. And then we arrange the books on bookshelves, which we collect into libraries, storing vast amounts of text and knowledge in a pretty compact form. In the same way, the DNA inside your cells is wrapped around proteins known as histones to make a structure known as a nucleosome. Think of it as a page in a book. Nucleosomes are folded into more complex structures, which are wound together to make chromatin. There are still higher levels of organization, such as chromatin loops and chromosome territories, but we're gonna stick with chromatin for now. There are basically two types of chromatin. Heterochromatin is more tightly packed, making genes relatively inaccessible, while euchromatin is looser, so genes are easier to reach. It's a bit like the difference between a book being open on a library table or stored somewhere on a shelf. You can read the book either way, but it takes more effort if you have to find it, take it down, and flip to the right chapter. So, the distribution of euchromatin and heterochromatin influences which of your genes are switched on and which are inactive. The problem is that this pattern changes as we age. The loss of heterochromatin model of aging was proposed in the late 1990s. The idea is that the heterochromatin pattern degrades during aging, so genes that should be silent become active and wreak havoc. We've since discovered that the picture is a bit more complicated. Heterochromatin doesn't just disappear as we age. It also shows up in new places, so-called senescence-associated heterochromatin foci. This leads to instability and means that some genes get switched off when they should be switched on. To go back to our analogy, 
the library is becoming difficult to use or even getting damaged because it hasn't been maintained. Books that should be easily accessible, maybe dictionaries for example, have been packed up and put away, and books that should be harder to reach, such as first editions or rare manuscripts, are scattered open on tables. Lots of different factors affect chromatin structure, and one of the things they respond to is DNA damage. If chromatin remodeling factors move to sites where DNA is damaged, but then don't always return to their original location, it might partly explain why the heterochromatin pattern changes with age. In 2009, researchers discovered a link between chromatin remodeling and Hutchison-Gilford progeria syndrome. It turns out that the gene mutated in HGPS is involved in organizing the nucleosome. The protein it encodes interacts with other proteins that regulate chromatin, and the mutation somehow causes these other proteins to get broken down. This results in misregulation of the chromatin, leading to changes in its structure and causing premature aging. Another premature aging disorder, Werner syndrome, also seems to be linked to changes in chromatin. A 2015 study found that the Werner protein associates with several proteins that control and modify chromatin. The prematurely aged cells had lower heterochromatin levels and other epigenetic changes. The researchers also confirmed that the Werner protein is lower in normally aged cells, suggesting that the same changes might occur during normal aging. If we could reverse these changes, that is, tidy up the library, or find a way to prevent them, we might be able to delay or even undo some of the damage caused by aging. Experiments with a group of genes called the Yamanaka factors hold out hope that this might be possible, but that's the subject of another video. The Life Extend Show channel is also where you'll find weekly episodes of Lifespan News. This month, host Brent Nally took a look back at 2020 and covered the things to watch in 2021. In January, Science to Save the World explored whether large-scale tree planting was a good idea for removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and dove into the use of artificial intelligence to study proteins. Here's a taste of that episode. You may remember Google's DeepMind from their AI system AlphaGo, which beat the world champion Go player in 2016. This was a major achievement for AI that arrived sooner than predicted. Just recently, DeepMind has achieved significant success in accurately predicting protein structures using its system AlphaFold. This is exciting news. It illustrates how AI may indeed be moving at exponential speeds and may help science in more immediate and unexpected ways. Proteins are essential to life, tiny machines that support nearly all its functions. Made up of chains of amino acids, they are large, complex molecules. A protein's function mostly depends on its unique 3D structure. Some diseases arise from errors in protein folding, so a full understanding of proteins is monumental. In addition, it could allow more precision in drug creation. In his acceptance speech for the 1972 Nobel Prize in Chemistry, Christian Affensen famously postulated that in theory, a protein's amino acid sequence should fully determine its structure. And so began a five-decade quest to solve this problem. This isn't easy. A protein can fold in an astronomical number of ways. Add to this a huge amount of amino acid sequence possibilities, and the job is incredibly challenging. Dr. Cyrus Leventhal estimated that a protein has 10 to the 300th possible conformations. Scientists have determined actual protein structures by using techniques such as nuclear magnetic resonance and X-ray crystallography. However, these methods require the use of multi-million dollar equipment and can take years of rigorous and elaborate work for each protein. We know of over 200 million proteins, yet we've only mapped around 170,000 of them using these experimentally determined methods. As early as the 1980s, scientists tried computational solutions, but with poor results. Starting in 1994, Professor John Moult and Christoph Fidelis founded Critical Assessment of Protein Structure Prediction, CASP, to accelerate this approach. Occurring every other year, the CASP challenge has prompted various teams to advance methods of identifying protein structure from sequence. CASP chooses recently determined protein structures that are not published in advance. Therefore, teams must go in blind to predict the structure of previously unknown proteins and verify accuracy against the real model. No cheating. AlphaFold competed in 2018 and did very well, but at CASP 14, 
it effectively crushed it by scoring over twice as high as the next best team. AlphaFold was trained on all 170,000 publicly available protein structures. The team expanded on their prior model, using new deep learning architectures, which enabled unparalleled accuracy. A full paper will be published that will describe the specific deep learning methods used for this recent model. AlphaFold structure predictions were in some cases nearly identical to the originals made using experimental methods. How does CASP compare the accuracy of the predicted proteins to the experimentally obtained models? A method known as Global Distance Test GDT, ranks results on a scale from 1 to 100. GDT can be thought of as the percentage of amino acid residues beads in the protein chain within a threshold distance from the correct position. A score of around 90 GDT is informally considered to be on par with results obtained from experimental methods. The AlphaFold system achieved a median score of 92.4 GDT overall across all targets. One scientist used an AlphaFold prediction to determine the structure of a bacterial protein in half an hour. He had been trying for a decade to get a solution by other methods. On a grand level, the remarkable breakthrough of AlphaFold will allow scientists to understand diseases more quickly and develop more effective drugs to fight them. It could also have impact outside the medical field, such as building enzymes to reduce plastic waste or even removing carbon from the atmosphere. DeepMind cautions that there is still much to learn about how multiple proteins form complexes and how they interact with DNA, RNA, or small molecules. With that caveat, AlphaFold is a promising example of how AI is becoming one of humanity's most useful tools, expanding our scientific knowledge at an ever faster pace. New additions to our website include a new journal club discussion featuring Irina and Michael Conboy speaking on their own paper, which shows that diluting the aged blood factors in blood plasma reduces the inflammation of mouse neurons back to levels associated with younger animals. Coming up on February 11th, the International Longevity Alliance and the Healthy Life Extension Society will host a Zoom conference in which renowned scientists are invited to give presentations on both rodent and human studies. An online discussion of the conference will be held the following day. That's it for this episode of the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast. Thank you very much for spending another month with us and for your help in the fight against age-related diseases. Whether you're donating, spreading the word, or simply listening to our content, we appreciate your help. Remember to subscribe, leave a review, and post about us on social media. This will increase our reach and introduce more people to the importance of life extension science. Don't forget, you can get additional deep dives into science, technology, and futurism on the Future Grind podcast. Find out more at futuregrind.org. Once again, I'm your host, Ryan O'Shea, and on behalf of the team at LEAF, we wanted to thank you for joining us. We hope to see you next time on the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast.